Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to Stonehearth Capital Management's quarterly update webinar series, CIO's Corner, with our Chief Investment Officer, Chris Gauthier. I'm Amanda Sylvia. I'm the Senior Client Service Associate at SEM. And before we dive in, a few quick housekeeping notes. Uh, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window to submit any questions you have throughout the webinar. We'll aim to address as many as possible at the end if we run short on time. Either Chris or I will follow up with you afterward to ensure that your questions are answered. Now, I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker, Chris Gauthier, Stonehearth's Chief Investment Officer, brings over 20 years of experience in investment management. He oversees our firm's investment policy and strategy, including asset allocation, risk management, research, and portfolio management. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Amanda, uh, for that very nice introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today, or, you know, be the last few days of summer here in New England. Um, speaking of summer, due to our busy summer schedules, we're actually holding this quarterly call a little bit later than usual. Um, so it's both good and bad. Um, the good is that we have more up-to-date data, so we can kind of use the end of July as a as a talking point for all the data that we have here, not the end of the second quarter, because we have the up-to-date data, so we might as well use it, um, not the usual Q2 end. Um, I'm thinking about this presentation, the title, you know, really sums up what's going on. Slow growth is still growth. And it's really what we're experiencing right now, whether it's economic data, financial markets, we seem to have hit the summer lull, right? Um, and to me, the key moving forward is to decipher, if this is the start of really of a new regime, you know, something change, or really just a pause that refreshes. Uh, you know, given the title right now, you probably know what side of the argument I come down on. But, you know, we're going to take a look at that data that supports um, the pause that refreshes thesis. Um, before we do that, we're always going to start with where we have been. Um, then we'll move on to where we are now and where we may be going based on the weight of the evidence. So let me take a look at the second quarter. 2024, you can see there was really a top heavy performance, really driven by that NASDAQ. And as a reminder for anyone looking at the screen, anything in blue is going to be the US equity market. So you get the NASDAQ, SP, small caps, and REITs. Anything in green is international, I think, you know, Europe. Asia, anything in purple is fixed income, so bond related, and anything yellow is anything that doesn't fit into those other three categories. Um, so like we started off, NASDAQ was up almost 8%, a little bit over 8% um, in the quarter, um, really driven by the big tech and the MAG7, continues to dominate perform performance. Um, saw a big rise in gold, right? That's that second one, up 4.5%. You now we have a war going on in Europe, potential war in the Middle East, we have election concerns, so a lot of geopolitical tensions out there. So gold is kind of getting a nice bid on that. Um, but like we talked about, concentration remains. It really was a top heavy performance. And the best way to reflect that is when we break down the S&P 500 into two different parts. So what we're looking at here is publicly traded ETFs in the marketplace. That purple line is the S&P 500 weighted by market cap. So that's the Apple at 8%, NVIDIA at 7%. And you look at the quarter, you end up with a nice 4.22% performance in that ETF. Now, another way to look at the S&P 500 is to take all those 503 constituents, yes, there's 503 constituents in the S&P due to corporate actions, and just equal weight them in the portfolio. So NVIDIA no longer is 7%, it is 25 bits. BIPs, Apple's no longer 6%, Apple's 25 BIPs, and so forth. And when you do that, you end up with that orange line, and you can see the performance was actually down in Q2 2024, down 2.5%. So you can see that really is that top heavy performance, the concentration risk, we continue to see that in the marketplace. And even when we take a longer look and look at the one-year performance as of June 30th, 2024, um, you still see that concentration. But the difference to me is that you see it more broad-based performance, right? So it may not be keeping up with the 30% rise in the NASDAQ, but the S&P 500 up 24, international up 11, emerging markets up 10. Those are still very strong performance numbers, unlike we saw in the quarter. So it's really across the board. And again, looking at the same colors we we're looking at before, anything in blue is US, anything in green international, anything in purple is bonds, and anything in yellow is it doesn't fit into their marketplace. So again, really the only thing that did not work 
over the past year with long-term treasuries. And we all know the story about the Fed and how that's impacting long-term treasuries and thematic. And that's really the unprofitable growth piece of the marketplace. Um, those small cap companies that um, are growing very fast but may have no profits to show for it. And I see that really hasn't been paid off in that space over the past year. Uh, but overall, again, very strong performance over the past year would take this in any marketplace. So again, very strong performance. So that's kind of where we've been. Um, so let's kind of take a look at where we are now. And what we've always done recently is really start with monetary policy, because I think it is one of the biggest things driving markets right now. Not the only thing, there's still fundamentals, earnings, sentiment, technical, but the Fed has playing a big role in the market. So this is as of July 31st. This is kind of when we start moving the data to July 31st cutoff. And what we're looking at here is the Fed funds rate um, going back in time to 1993. And then really what we want to focus on is where is it going? So what we have here is two different perspectives of where the Fed funds rate will be in the future. Green line right here is market expectations. That's what the market thinks. And the blue line here is what the Fed does based on their plot points. And really you can take it away that, you know, they're pretty much in line, right? It, they a little bit differ on the speed and magnitude, right? But directionally, they're both headed down and to the right, which means lower Fed rates from here. And we agree with that. Maybe not as fast or as many um, lower rates as the market thinks, but they're directionally definitely in the same way. And another way to take a look at this is the most up-to-date data, which takes into account today's um, inline inflation numbers. The CPI came in inline today. And what we're looking at is a website from CME Group. And what this takes is the futures market. So this is actual money behind this. So this isn't just people who are just betting it with nothing. There's actual money behind this. And what this is showing is what the market thinks the Fed funds is going to be at different times. So we got the meeting dates for the Fed. We know they meet in September 18th, then they meet in November and December, and then they start 2025. And this is the probability of where it's going to be. So right now we're at 525 to 550, the Fed uses the range. So what this says in the September meeting, the market is expecting at least one cut. And if you add the 475, 500 and the 500, it's almost 100% chance of a cut um, in September, just arguing over whether it was 25 basis points or 50 basis points. And then we start getting down to further, we look at the next meeting in November, that looks like it's going to be definitely a 50% basis point cut. And we get to no no uh, December, the market's pricing in 100 basis points of cuts. Um, that's a little aggressive, right? So again, we kind of agree on the directionally where it's going, um, but for that magnitude and that fast of a rate cut, we really have to see a lot of more deterioration in the marketplace that we're just not seeing yet. So let's take a look and take a really close look at the data that has the largest impact on this path and the level of interest rates, prices and jobs, and see where we differ from the market. So what we're looking at here is prices, right? This is inflation. So this is what just hit today, we came in line. So it's a little bit lower than it is right now, but this is as of July 31st. You can see the top consumer price index, right? That's a CPI, the headline, 2.97. Consumer price core, take out energy and food, is a little bit higher at 3.28, because we've seen energy come down a lot. We definitely have not seen food come down a lot. Producer price index, kind of ticking up a little bit there, but still, you know, off the highs that we've seen in the previous periods. And that's the input prices. And then the bottom one is expected change. That's what investors think um, the inflation, inflation is going to be based on some other inputs. So again, big takeaway, as we spoke about before, right? Progress, yes, definitely. Helpful, absolutely. Mission accomplished, not there yet. So again, doesn't mean we can't have a rate cut in September based on the data we're seeing, but what we fear is that that rate cut, given that we're not having been successful in taming inflation entirely, we may get a resurgence of inflation um, at the end of 2024, 25. Uh, and another way to look at this is what makes up this number, right? Because we always see the headline, but what goes into it? And what we're looking at here is going back, chart from JP Morgan, going back to 2021, and just the components of CPI by color, right? You can see green energy, Shelter, this is dark blue. Dining, uh, recreation, other services, light blue. Auto insurance is red, which is, was a big driver of inflation for a while. Core goods, food at home. And you can see the 9% back in 2022, and we're down here by 3% um, in June 2024. So again, what's the takeaway for us here and why we're looking at this, the components? We're looking at the components of what makes up this. As you can see, that's really shelter. 
and dining, recreation, and other services. And I don't know how many people are looking for houses out there, how many people have children, graduating college, trying to enter the housing market. There's no really fall in housing prices, right? It's going one way and up. Even with that increase in mortgage rates we've seen over the past year, we're still not really seeing that decreasing shelter cost, right? It's just a supply and demand issue out there. So kind of tough to get that done, no matter how high the Fed raises rates in the short, I mean, in the short term. So again, lower rates, not seeing that come down, that may be sticky. Same thing with dining, rec dining recreation services, right? That's the consumer. I'm going to take a look at the consumer and see how they're doing. Um, and, you know, given the strength we're seeing consumer market, not really sure they're going to have, that's going to come down anymore. So cutting rates with inflation still not at your target may lead to, you know, a slowdown in rate cuts or even maybe a rate increase in 2025. So taking a look at the consumer, we'll start with empl in employment, which is the jobs, right? You know, same thing we're seeing across most of the data we're looking at in the economy, you know, definitely weakening, but really off a boil, right? So still showing no signs of freezing. That pink is the unemployment rate. We're at 4.3. Long-term average is 6. So again, very healthy. Is it weaker than it was? Is it rising a little bit? Definitely. Um, is it weak? No. It's just a little bit less strong than it was. Labor force participation rates, the next chart down that green, see more people are joining the labor force. See that big drop off um, after COVID and you see that steadily rising as more people join the labor force, which is a good thing. The more labor you have, more people join the force, more paychecks, more spending helps the economy grow. And to me, the really important one is this real average hourly earnings. So this is after inflation. So we can see that kind of rising and up to the right, which it was going higher, but still heading in the positive direction. And lastly, Jobs. We're creating jobs in this economy. And, you know, it's really tough to find a way to a recession or lower prices if we keep creating jobs at higher wages and more people join the labor force and more people are employed. So, again, that's really the basis of why, even though we do think there may be a rate cut in the 2024, it's not going to be a, as many rate cuts as the market may expect right now. So, one other further leg of support for the higher for longer is the current easy level of monetary conditions. So what we're looking at here is a nominal 10-year treasury yield in blue. Um, in brown is uh, real. So that's, that's taking away the nominal yield, take away inflation. You get the real, in our mind, cost of money, right? So how cheap is it to borrow money? Um, and you can see that when money is very cheap, it's very easy to borrow, and there's debt. And we can see that it was 2021. And the Fed raising rates by over 500 basis points you can see it's definitely increased the cost of money. But compared to history, we look back, it's still not high. So like all the data we're seeing, is it getting worse? Yes. Is it bad? No. It's just getting a little bit less good than it was before. So money's still freely available and cheap. And actually, when we take a look at our modeling, we look at Ned Davis's model, they have a good monetary indicator. And they're showing the same thing, that you know monetary conditions are still supportive of equity prices and are still easy in the marketplace. So that's kind of really where we stand from a monetary. So now we want to really turn to the actual economic data points, right, that matter. And, you know, kind of take a look at the health of this economy through the biggest two players, right, the U.S. government and consumers. So we'll take a look at the sick person first, and that's with the U.S. government. And we're looking at their federal finances. And like we said, the government's not doing so well. Um, you can see that they're still borrowing almost 30% of their budget every single year. And we look over... To the right down here, federal net debt keeps growing, showing no signs of slowing. And this number is from the CBO, so it's not Democrats, not Republican, or anything in between. This is a unbiased forecast based on the, the, the Congressional Budget Office, which is nonpartisan, and just basically says whatever the law says right now, that goes into the future. And you can see that based on that, upwards and right to the debt. What's really scary for us is that top shot now, right? So this is federal deficit and net interest outlays. Interest is getting carried away. And the more the rates go up, the higher the interest expense, the more debt, the higher the interest expense. And it ends up being almost 30% of our outlays four or five years from now. So again, not sustainable, but less important in the near term, right? Because it's all about confidence and the government can still borrow. So, but it must be accounted for. So, you know, when we look at the federal finances as an influence on the economy, um, yes, it concerns us. Yes, it's going to be a problem just not yet. More positive is the consumer. And look at kind of the same data on the left consumer balance sheet. 
very strong, always is. Um, they're in better shape, right? Like all the like the economic data we are seeing, we are seeing some signs of stress and weakness. When you look over here, the household debt service ratio is really like we like to judge the health of the consumer. This is how much of the consumer's personal income is going to pay down the debt. Same thing like the government paying the net interest payments. Uh, you know, for better or worse, we live in a debt fueled society, and really, our spending. capacity is based on how much we need to pay back of our debt, right? How much of our cash flow is going to pay down our debt. And we can see that going on through history, that when it starts getting 13%, like back in 08, you know, those high double digits or you know, mid double digits, it starts to get concerning. So like we're seeing everywhere, is it getting worse? Yes. Is it back where it was in 2008, fourth quarter 2007? No. Um, so again, they still have the capacity to spend, but it's something we need to keep an eye on. And you can see that entering into delinquencies, which is down here on the lower right. So you can see the auto credit card starting to tick up a little bit. Um, not horrible, not you know at record levels, but again, showing some signs of concern there. So consumer showing some signs of weakness, but still in good shape to be able to spend. Um, and it's showing up in the numbers. So when we look at the PMIs, and again, these are diffusion indices. So this isn't really looking at what happened. This is asking current um, companies, you know, what they expect in the future. So the whole list of questions the government asks, and they say, is it the same, getting worse, or getting better? If the majority and answers is getting better, you're above 50, that shows an economy in expansion. If the majority is below 50, you show an economy in contraction. You can see that dichotomy here. That red line is services. So remember when I showed you that CPI and the components, that big piece of the inflation number right now is based on services? How can we get that down when we see an expanding service economy right up at 50%, over 51%? So again, that's where those numbers, you know, there's that disconnect between um, inflation, where's it going and the Fed interest rates. Um, on the other side, we see manufacturing definitely been weaker lately. Um, across the board, falling down to almost 46.8 in contraction mode. Um, luckily, consumers make up over 70% of the economy. So that, on balance, if you use the weight of the evidence, is more positive than negative. Um, still showing an economy in expansion. And really, when you look globally, you see a really, at least from an economic standpoint, um, a globe that is in very good shape. We're looking at those same composites, manufacturing and services, just kind of mixed together from multiple countries. Um, across the globe, you can read them on the left, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, all the countries we know. Um, and to keep it simple, right? Green is expansion, red's contraction. But we look at the final numbers here for June and July, and companies report at different intervals, so it's not exactly right. You see some yellow there, so it's kind of neutral, but much more green. So you got a very healthy economy, um, showing a global economy that's in expansion mode, despite little pockets of weaknesses here and there. So again, globally, the world's in very good shape from an economic standpoint. And so when we look at, take this all together, take the weight of the evidence, um, all the economic data we're seeing, you know, the, really the bottom line to us is, you know, we're seeing softness, right, across the board, no doubt about it, but really not enough to tip the weight of the evidence for now. And like I started off in the title, slower growth is still an economy in expansion and it's supported, supportive of financial assets, right? The, the, we recession call or the, re or the evidence for a recession is just really unsupported by the weight of the economic evidence we're seeing out there. So that's getting the economy. So I'll kind of turn to the equity markets and see where we stand. And we're gonna start with the valuation, the S&P 500. Um, as you can see, we're looking at the forward PE ratio, but in this color box, you can see some other valuation me measures, CAPE based on the forward PE, but also you take into account inflation, you use the 10, 10 year look back period. Um, dividend yield, how much companies are paying out, price to book, you know, the price of the S&P 500 compared to its assets on its balance sheet. More important, price to cash flow, how much cash companies are generating compared to what you're paying for that. Across the board, you see it's just overvalued. There's no way around it. We're in an overvalued state at the S&P 500. Um, and it is in the red zone, right? It's up over that one standard deviation at 20.7 times. Uh, but like we saw in performance, it was a concentration issue in the numbers, right? And despite the headline index overvalued condition, it doesn't represent the entire equity universe, right? Um, there are pockets and that could provide some a nice opportunity moving forward. And in a few charts um, on from here, we're going to take kind of look at those opportunities out there. Um, but before that, let's take a look at the flip side of the S&P 500's valuation picture through the technical lens. Right? So this is using technical as price action. Um, gives us a very different picture of the health of the S&P 500. We're looking at the, this is just a price boom, S&P 500. So upward and to the right is good, right?
That means it's, it's going higher, even though it's a little dip here. We see the moving averages, 50-day moving average is a shorter term, 200 days is a longer term, still upward to the right, so upward sloping to the right, that's positive and provides support for future price growth. Um, we look at support and resistance, right? This is where we call resistance, right? It was trying to get through, wouldn't break through, fell through, becomes resistance. When it finally broke through, now it becomes support, right? So anytime the market's above support, it's in a healthy condition, it's going up and to the right. So that looks healthy. We look at the RSI, which is it overbought or oversold. You know, it kind of cured some of the overbought conditions. So it's a little bit more price sensitive. And then we look at the MACD, short term, long term, still showing a positive. So again, uptrend and moving averages, slight dip in the short term, but really not enough to change a long term positive technical setup we see in the marketplace to help offset some of the valuation concerns. And next, look at the breadth, right? It's also providing support for future price appreciation. And this is looking at all the stocks that trade in the New York Stock Exchange and just looking how many are above that long-term 200-day moving average. But we see that over 70% of the stocks are above that 200-day moving average. So again, when we look at markets going upward, you always want to see a broad base for that market rally. You never want to see a narrow, narrowly concentrated rally. And at least from the breadth standpoint, we're seeing it broad. Now, it's not normally distributed where it's kind of top heavy in terms of that really good performance, but most of the stocks are at least rising in the marketplace over the long term, which is good. And we'd like to see that. Another strong support for equity market is earnings. So on the left-hand side, we're looking at EPS growth estimates, S&P 500, EFA was international, Japan, Europe, Pacific X Japan, emerging markets, and S&P 600 is small caps. You know, three months ago, one, one month ago, current, where we're looking for, and you can see it's kind of growing up to the right, right? So earnings are growing. But more important to us is this EPS revision number. So what this is, looking at the same group of stocks that we saw on the left-hand side, it takes all the analysts following the individual stocks and says, okay, if anybody in the analyst is upgrading, that's a positive. If they're downgrading, that's a negative. You sum that all together. If you end up on the positive side of the ledger, which is this line right here, above one, that means more companies are being upgraded than downgraded. That's a good thing, right? That means earnings should be growing and beating expectations, which is really even more important than actually growing. You really want to see them beat expectations. And we look at that blue line, which is the current and the bars, you can see S&P 500 firmly over one international firmly, Japan firmly, Europe firmly. Um, little trouble in emerging markets in Pacific X Japan really due to China. And even small caps, despite the little poor performance, they're still over one. So again, this provides support um, for future price appreciation because we're getting um, earnings expectations higher than expected. So when we look at the weight of the evidence, it is a balance it, some, to offset some of those valuation concerns. And like we talked about the, previously about the S&P 500 it might be expensive, there are pockets of attractiveness, like I mentioned, right? And this is this chart that shows that. So we're looking at global equity valuations, and we're just breaking the equity market down, expanding our views from the S&P 500. And we can see that's definitely expensive on this. Looking at valuation to itself, right? So this is PE, same number we looked at over there. This is forward PE, same number we looked at the previous chart, price to book, price to sales. Again, things we've looked at before, just breaking it down to different pieces of the equity market. And we can see that there is some very pockets of cheapness. Anything that's the top three is in green, most expensive is red. But even the US, we look at value, right? Even though it's high, it's still pretty cheap. EFER has some good valuation support, really good valuation support in China and Brazil. But again, sometimes things are cheap for a reason. So the other side of this valuation is momentum, right? And the holy grail when we're looking at asset classes is we want to find an asset class that has strong momentum and very good valuation support. It's very rare. You don't find it that often. Um, so until that appears you and you and tilt into it really greatly, you want to look for the balance, right? And make sure you don't get out over the tip of your skis on either factor. Um, so look at momentum. You see it's almost the offset of that, right? Anything that was really cheap has really poor momentum and vice versa. Um, but again, looking at balance, you can see that, you know, Russell 1000 value, not too bad, neither green nor red on either one. Same thing with Europe, right? Having the best balance between momentum and valuation, you can kind of tilt into those stocks because you have support from momentum and valuation. Um, and that. So that's where you can find those pockets of attractiveness there. So that's kind of how we look at the equity market. And before 
leaving the equity land. Um, I really want to take one more look um, at the potential impact of the concentration of short-term performance we're seeing in the top names and in index that we've seen. Um, Bridgewater Associates, you know, Ray Dalio, you may have heard of, they really do some excellent research um, on this. And what they're showing here is looking at the S&P 500 and looking at the top 10 companies in the index. So with the benefit of hindsight, which all research has, so if you take a company that's 10 years before it joined the top 10 of the S&P 500 index, it earned 11.8% above the market return, right? So this isn't just an absolute, this is a relative performance. Five years before, it earned 20% excess returns. Three years before, you see where I'm going with this. Now, once they make the top 10, what happens after that? Three years after, still some outperformance, but it's very tight, right? Only 0.5%. And then five years after, that total outperformance is gone. So again, what's the conclusion and takeaway from this research is that, you know, the time to own the top names in the index is before the, the top names in the index, not after. So again, that's kind of what we're looking at here when we look at the S&P 500, that maybe it's time to go into other aspects of the top 10 to get this excess return in the marketplace. So that's equity land. Um, so let's kind of finish up with the current environment with fixed income. Um, and what we're looking at here is the yield curve. So again, one month, two month, three month, four month. You can see that here, two years, three years. This is just treasuries, right? When they mature. And this is just the yield. The current one is in this gold color right here is what they're paying at maturity now. So how much interest rate on the different uh, maturity dates of the U.S. treasuries. Put that all together, you get the treasury curve, kind of gives you an idea of what's going on in the fixed income market and where investors are finding attractiveness. So we see this massive move in rates, and that's just down here, right? So the one month move. Um, it seems small, 46 basis points on a five year, 50 basis points on a three year, but these are massive moves. These are like three and four standard deviation events in the fixed income place because it's a very boring spot most of the time. Um, you know, the movement rates really based on the recent softness and the economic data, which we, we looked at, right? It's not horrible, but it is getting softer, you know, and with the concentration on the Fed and everybody focused, you know, every economic data point is dissected, exaggerated, blown out of proportion, lots of noise in the day to day, really. But looking at the overall picture here, right, really shows in a market expecting rate cuts, right? And soon, as we see the belly of the curve, which is just a fancy word for the two to seven, right? It's the belly of the curve. Um, fell faster than the long end of the curve, which is over here, the 20 and 30, causing a slight steepening in the curve. Really didn't see movement in the short end, right? As they move when the Fed moves and the Fed hasn't moved yet, um, and the longer rates move in expectations of the Fed and the economy. So that overall picture is pointing to a slowing, but not contracting economy, sound familiar, um, and lower rates ahead, sound familiar? So in agreement with the equity market and what we're seeing in the economic data. So fixed income still has a role to play in portfolios. Um, you know, it hasn't recently in the past 10 years. I know there's been some negative performance, but the really big difference now is that it does provide some balance to equity with rates coming down, but also not just based on rates, there is some actually income and fixed income again, right? We haven't had this in a while. And what we're looking at here is over the past 10 years, the different rates you could have earned on fixed income. And you can see that, you know, before you could earn 1% on average of 1.8 U.S. Treasuries. The difference now is you can get 4% in U.S. Treasuries. Look at new, um, IG corporate, you can get 5%. If you're willing to take on a little bit more risk and go into EM debt, which, you know, is very attractive at 8% risk. So again, you have some income to offset some of that risk. So it provides some good balance in the portfolio. So again, do we want to be overweight fixed income in this environment? No, but having some to play a role to balance out that equity risk and still provide some decent returns here with that high income stream, definitely good for a portfolio. So last, we look at credit spreads, um, really that tight across the board. And what we're looking at here is just the cost of corporations above treasuries um, that they pay to borrow. So when I'm a corporation, think IBM, I go out and I want to borrow money from the bank. They say, okay, the Fed's 10 years at 4%. We think you're a little bit risky company. We're going to charge you 2% above that. So your interest rate on your debt is now 6%. And that's all this is reflecting for a whole group of corporate investment grade companies and high yield companies, maybe a little bit less high credit rating. And what we see is that when this is tight, there's little stress in the markets. Banks don't see a lot of risk ahead. They think companies will be able to manage through whatever economic environment comes and pay back their interest. That's a good thing. 
Uh, on the flip side, um, it's not too great for returns going forward in these um, asset classes because there's little room for rate compression, and that's how you get that capital appreciation. So you just get the coupon. So again, not bad, but you may have better luck going to the government or maybe some EM debt in terms of get some of that price appreciation. So again, good for the economy, not so good for returns going forward, provide support for the equity market that we don't see a lot of stress in the marketplace. So before we take a look at our modeling, um, I want to spend a quick second, if that's even possible anymore, on the election um, and the potential impact on markets. I mean, I'm sure you've seen, if you've looked at um, different graphs, watched TV, multiple graphs, charts, visuals about performance of stocks under every type of election scenario, Republican Senate, Democratic Congress, Republican President, Democratic across the board, any which way, slice and dice, you can see anything. Um, I know I have seen them all. Uh, but I thought this chart from, you know, BlackRock really gets the, to the point I'm trying to get across in these elections when we talk to clients and things like that. Um, it's really the best way. So what we're looking at here is U.S. stock sectors by president, put together by BlackRock. And you can see Bill Clinton, George Bush, President uh, Obama, President Trump, and President Biden across time and what each sector did. So the easiest way to look at this, if you look at President Trump, you know, and when Trump was coming into office or before he came into office, if you said Trump gets elected, I guarantee that his drill baby drill is going to make energy companies go through the roof. And we do know he doesn't like big tech and they're going to have trouble in that environment. Well, it's kind of funny, almost the opposite happened. Infotech was the best performing sector under Trump and energy was the worst. Move a few years ahead and President Biden's the, the elect. And what's going to happen? Well, he's going to kill the oil companies. He's going to invest in clean energy. He won't let anybody drill. Um, and he's just going to destroy that sector. Well, guess what? It was the best performing sector on the Biden. In fact, when you look at President Obama and Trump, the top three performing sectors were the same. And how could you have two more different people in the Oval Office? Um, so again, the takeaway for me looking at all this data is, you know, you need to know what you don't know. And really, despite making for good debate on TV elections, outcomes have very little impact on markets. It's just one small input into the larger fundamental, technical, and sentiment picture that's really driving markets um, over the longer term. So again, nice cocktail chatter, but not a lot of impact over the long term on what's going to perform or outperform in equity markets. So with that, let's take a look at our modeling. Um, we start with the Ned Davis Research Fab Five. Um, this is, has over 25 indicators with live data going back to 1981, broken down to four model components. They have tape, like that's technical, sentiment, it's pretty self-explanatory, monetary, that's what I talked about before when we're looking at the cost of money chart. Um, they have a whole bunch of sub-indicators and they come out bullish. And what that means is that the monetary conditions are very easy, money's cheap. So we come to the same conclusion and combos prices overseas and other asset markets. Put that all together. What's the change from last quarter end, last time we spoke? Well, it declined, from, declined by one. So this was a three. It's now a two, but still firmly in the bullish zone. That slight decline in the short term is really due to that tape technical and move tape from bullish to neutral. Uh, but again, still firmly in the bullish zone. And when we look at the history, you can see when the Fab 5 model is above 1.5, it's at two right now you get a potential gain of 26%. When it's below that, you get to 8% and 17. So again, does it guarantee future returns? Does it say the market has to go up from here? No, but it says the weight of the evidence based on historical modeling that has proven strong throughout history shows that, that the odds are on your side for a future rise in the market. The other model we use is our own internal model. Um, it differs a little, but it's confirming the bullish tilt of NDR. I mean, last time we spoke, it was at a positive one. Um, again, this is as of July, since we have the most updated data, and it's still at a positive one. Uh, there were some changes um, under, the, under the hood. And again, it's good to remember that this model was built as a complement to Ned Davis. So we used different imports, right? You didn't want you to build a model that's just the same as Ned Davis. It was really not adding any value. We just saw some holes in Ned Davis's model that we wanted to add to our modeling. So in a technical um, indicator, we saw improvement when he saw weakness. Why? Well, we have a bigger focus on reversion. Those are also means that markets oscillate around the mean, trying to identify long-term inflection points, right? When to exit and, act and enter the market. And due to the weakness, that has become more positive. Um, Ned Davis relies more on the momentum and the trend in that factor, which is why they saw that uh, be a little bit weaker. 
And that's really offset in our model by weakening economy. And we can see that down here at the macroeconomic level. Last time we met, we're at positive two. We're now at a neutral. NDI uses monetary on conditions, not economic data. I mean, they're modeling, and that's what that difference is. But all in all, when we look at their model, our model, the message is telling us that, yes, it may be getting a little bit weaker, um, but overall, the weight of the evidence has not tipped into the bearer zone yet. And the setup, at least, is for future price appreciation as of July 31st, 2024. So take a look at asset allocation, how this translates into portfolios and where we're allocating for clients. So we look at the equities, we're still overweight, like we were last time we spoke. We do see a difference in the United States. We're now overweight, again, on the back of stronger momentum. Some pockets of valuation support we saw there, like value stocks, dividend, a little bit of small cap. Still have some um, exposure to those uh, MAG7 stocks, right? Because we saw the positive momentum. We don't want to be totally underweight that. So we do have some exposure there. The international developed, we saw that really good balance, right, in between momentum and valuation. Um, not extreme on either side, but going showing some good signs on either one. So we have overweight that. Merging markets, still neutral, right? Again, a lot of China concerns, despite with the good stuff going on maybe in Latin America. So we're neutral that. Um, fixed income, still plays a role in portfolio. We saw that high income, but given where we are and the opportunity set we see in equity land and the setup we're seeing, we want to be a little bit underweight that and more overweight equities. Opportunistic bucket, overweight, that really makes up some precious metals. We saw the really resilient gold out there with all the geopolitical risks. So we like gold as, an, um, as a holding, but also due to our relative strength strategy. And what we've implemented here in our portfolios in the opportunistic bucket is a way to measure multiple asset classes on a proprietary multi-factor momentum strategy. So all the different time periods, what's performing well, what's not performing well, and being able to allocate to those pieces of the market, whether it be international, NASDAQ, uh, momentum stocks, Latin America, that are performing well and look to, put, look to outperform. So we're overweight that bucket right now, given the market setup. And cash, not good or bad, 4%, not horrible. Um, but again, given the opportunity set, you'd rather have your money allocated other places in the um, financial um, balance sheet. So with that, let's kind of look at the key takeaways from this presentation. So one, right, we saw the markets pricing in four rate cuts, 2024, little aggressive, <laughs> little aggressive, but the tra trajectory is correct, right? We are heading lower here. We just may not be heading as low as the market thinks. Um, really based on the high for longer regime, right? The Holy Trinity, we talked about this, this before. Inflation is definitely lower, but not have but not where it should be yet, not at that 2%. Employment, weakening, but still strong, showing high wage growth. Kind of tough to see why the Fed needs to cut to save the employment market when it's so strong. And bond liquidity, right? We saw the stress in the bond market, just not there. Good companies can still borrow at very inexpensive rates. So until any of those three things resolve itself, we do see the Fed being a little bit higher for longer than the market thinks. Slow economic growth for sure, but still growth. Providing support, consumer saw, you know, little cracks here and there, but hanging tough, still spending money. Federal government, still spending money, but not as strong <laughs> so much. But it's a problem for a later date, right? It's really a confidence issue. We're not seeing any lack of confidence in the federal government yet. Short-term weakness um, doesn't offset the long-term bullish technical picture. Upward moving averages, support still firmly in place. So again, even if you can have a little bit of a pullback here, it doesn't dent the long-term strength we're seeing in all the technicals out there. Positive earnings momentum, right? Earnings drive prices, and we're seeing really good earnings from companies out there. But overall, the market is healthy. You know, signs of froth in certain areas, MAG7. Um, so you really want to rotate towards you know, more favorable technical valuation setup, a little bit overseas, maybe go down and cap a little bit, look at some of the names that haven't made the top 10 yet, but could make the top 10 over the next five to 10 years, give you some really good performance there. Fixed income, slight steeping of the yield curve, bond market begins to price in a more dovish Fed, seen that across the board. Uh, elections matter. But history shows, right? Bet investing based on potential outcome is a fool's game. And lastly, remain balanced, right? While tilting, tilting into tactical opportunities and take advantage of valuation dispersions we're seeing in the marketplace. So really, that's all I had today to go over. Um, the appendix and compliance disclosures. Hope you can read that really quickly. And now I'll turn it back to Amanda for any questions you may have. 
Hi, Chris. Thank you so much. Uh, so just as a reminder to everyone, please use that Q&A section at the bottom uh, of your Zoom taskbar there to enter in some of your questions. But we do have a few just to get started. Uh, the first one I have here, Chris, is I keep hearing about the Japanese yen causing the U.S. stock market to sell off, which doesn't quite make sense to me. Can you please explain this? Um, yeah, the yen parry trade. Uh, yeah, getting a lot of press lately. Um all over the marketplace, um, causing that little sell-off we've had two weeks ago about. Um, sure. So I'll try to explain it in as simple terms as possible, um, how this can kind of get impacted across the marketplace. So the yen is Japanese currency, just like the US dollar is for the United States. Yen is Japanese currency, how they transact all the transactions on the island. So the yen has been very cheap, right? The Bank of Japan has kept their rates very low almost at zero, and it's been a very cheap currency. So it's rates been low at below zero in Japan a long time, so it's relatively cheap to borrow, right? You know, it's very easy to borrow yen, very cheap. So hedge funds, investors went out there, borrowed yen very cheaply. So now I have money using leverage, and leverage is the key word here. Now I can invest it, right? So what do I, what do, I do with that money? Well, I can invest some in the Japanese market, right? It's already there, um, which a lot of investors did, because we saw when... This carry trade unwound. We saw the market, Japan market fall 12% in a day. But others took the yen and bought USD, right? More expensive country, but you can buy the MAG7. You could buy European equities. Um, you could buy tech stocks, right? And earn a premium by borrowing cheap and investing in these companies using leverage. So that kicker really was the amount of leverage used. So a small little uptick in the yen, like we saw when the when the Bank of Japan hiked rates by a little 25 basis points unexpectedly, caused this massive sell-off, not only in Japan, but we also saw it in the US and Europe as traders closed their bets. And also as people rushed to the exit before everybody else closed their bets. Everybody knew the trade was on. Everybody knew that the people who had the trade on with the amount of leverage they had, had to sell. So everybody else tried to get in front of that. Um, it just really shows how connected this financial system really is and really what happens when momentum flips, which is why you don't want to bet entirely on momentum. If you have your entire portfolio in that momentum, when that flips, it's very tough to be the first one out the door as you saw everybody rushing. So I hope that helps explain kind of what we're saying about why the yen kind of causes sell-off in the US. Thanks, Chris. Uh, the next question I have is, how do you look to add uh, Bitcoin to our portfolios? Uh, interesting. Given the recent launch, you know, the exchange traded products, it's really made it easier, right? So it's been more of a forefront on a research project over here because um, it's easy to get access, right? It doesn't require a thumb drive. doesn't require um, an account on Coinbase. So we've definitely taken a closer look at Bitcoin and also Ethereum, right? They also have some ETFs, e ETFs out there now. But we really still came to the same conclusion, right? There's a lot of froth, a lot of weak hands. There's no cash flow. So it really is just a sentiment and momentum trade in the space. And the coins don't provide a lot of benefit to a client's portfolio, right? It's still a risk asset that trades like a risk asset, not what it was advertised, right? It was supposed to be a safe harbor store of value. You know, it was down 6% in a week, 30% in like two weeks. I don't know how that's a store of value. Um, safe Harbor, it traded just like other equity markets. When the equity market sold off, it sold off, right? Not like gold that actually held up in value. So we don't think it's living up to the hype so far, but we will keep monitoring it. And if it ever becomes an asset that, you know, will be a value add to client portfolios, um, we really wouldn't hesitate to put it in. We just don't see it um, happening right now, um, given what we're seeing in the marketplace and those uh, coins out there. And it looks like we just have one more question. Uh, given the market has continued to sell off in August, does that change how you think about our portfolio? Um, yeah, interesting. Um, but we're constantly thinking about, you know, the portfolio, right? So yes, you know, as new data comes in, um, whether it be price action, whether it be economic, um, our current views are always influenced by that, right? Uh, but we really try to avoid focusing on any one data point and use that weight of the evidence approach when viewing the portfolio. So we may become a little more concerned or satisfied on the margin, but we really need to see that weight of the evidence tip the scales before making adjust adjustments, right? You know, so price action, while very important, is really only one of many inputs to the decision-making process. So the continuous sell-off is concerning. Um, but not enough to tip the scales based on the totality of the data we're seeing in the marketplace. 
you know, and, and we kind of look at history and it shows, you know, five to 10 percent. It's kind of where we in that drawdown. You know, it happens frequently, right? And over a third of the year is out there in the marketplace, I think, or something like that. I was looking at the research, um, has a five to 10 percent drawdown and over a third of the years are not down markets. So corrections tend to be normal and healthy while never fun. Um, they still tend to be normal and healthy and, you know, provide get, um, fire uh, fuel for future price gains. So again, definitely concerned, but not enough to tip the scales yet in terms of portfolio construction. Chris, thank you so much for all this information today. I just want to remind everybody, we do host these CEOs on our um, quarterly, uh, and you can go ahead right on our website, www.stonehearthcapital.com, right on the main page there, if you just scroll down to the bottom, and you can register for our next webinar, and hopefully I'll have this webinar recording up later this afternoon, so you can watch previous webinars as well. Uh, so we would love to have you on that next one, and we hope everyone enjoys the rest of their summer. Thank you, everyone.